Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, legal correspondent, author, and host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, a show about the rule of law, the law, and the Supreme Court justices who interpret it for the rest of us. I've been watching the high court for over two decades, and I bring all that experience and knowledge to examining the U.S. justice system and democracy. Each episode, I am joined by guests with deep knowledge of the law and policy who help me and you navigate our constitutional landscape. Slate's Amicus Podcast. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Hello, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. Today, my guest is Kathy Griffin. Yes, Kathy Griffin, the gay's favorite two-time Emmy and Grammy award-winning comedian. She's actually halfway to an EGOT. And Kathy made the Guinness Book of World Records. This is the fucking holy grail for a Gen Xer like me. I think she won recognition in the Guinness Book for writing and starring in 23 televised stand-up specials, which is more than any other comic. Kathy acts, she writes, she tweets, and she even got sued for tweeting. And she gets canceled and then rises up from the ashes to perform in Las Vegas at the Mirage. She'll be there October 6th. You can still get some tickets now. Today, I am talking to her about all kinds of things, including why she just got her lips tattooed, what it was like to date Quentin Tarantino and carry that movie Pulp Fiction, and even, even something special about Stevie Nicks. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You're just going to have to wait for it. Today, we'll be talking about her book, Official Book Club Selection, a memoir according to Kathy Griffin. We will be covering with honesty and compassion some difficult topics, including addiction. Okay, let's dive in. You look fabulous. Well, I've had my lips tattooed, as you know. I do know that. I wonder if we could talk about that. The swelling is going down, but um, I have scabs on the upper and lower outline, which is very unusual. I really like the hue, or would they call that the tint? What What, what is the word they you would it use? blushing your lips. Blushing. So it's is really it a like, tattoo. Who are we kidding? So tell me what the experiences was like, because it, it was seems... It fucking painful. Like... You lay down and she's literally taking a tattoo needle and like going over your lips like. (laughs) Hold on, Kathy, back all the fuck the way up. You walk. I need to know, like, what are you laying on? Is it like being at the dentist or is it more like a facial? It's like being in a facial. Okay, you're laying down. You're laying down and then she's like has you upside down, like if you're getting a facial. And then she gets a freaking tattoo needle with the ink and everything. And just first I brought her lipsticks as like a test. So she matched uh-huh. the color. And then um, I actually don't know if it's going to be this bold. It might be a little lighter. But um, this is this is day one where my lips are like pretty much back to their regular size. And it just looks weird because. Yeah. But it's so gonna... I'm very anxious to see how these heal because then I'll kind of know. But so because I think is good. Because people can't see what I'm seeing is the lower lip is perfectly fine. The upper lip is yeah. a little swollen, right? Yes. Like on yes. the top of that. But I think that's going to tone down. And the color, honey, that looks to me like Mac twig. Right? Did you bring that in? No, oh, but I brought in, like, I don't even know what colors, but I just love the idea of possibly waking up and feeling like I have lips. I like that too, because I hate having to constantly put lipstick on because I'm leaving prints all over glasses. And I, yes. I know the word have to. I, yeah. I should tell you that... Michael, you know Michael. We haven't met yeah. him, but he exists. I he's feel like, I know him. He's like, you don't need to wear makeup. And I'm like, it's not for you. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's, for, right? it's for me in the mirror. Me in the mirror. Right. And what is that about, though, do you think? It's just about wanting, first of all, it's about wanting to make life easier. And also, I actually do think it's this new society since COVID where I'm looking at myself a thousand times more than I ever did between like, Zoom, because, you know, I'm in AA, so I go to Zoom meeting every day, and I can't help but, like, look at myself also, and I get hypercritical, so I got my eyebrows microbladed. See, this is no eyebrow at all, because my eyebrows, all my hair turned blonde or gray, and as you get older, your freaking eyebrows fall out. 
Like I'm getting bald in my eyebrows. I mean, who so knew these I things would the happen? Brows. And look, if I could, I would do the full Tammy Faye. I would do lashes and eyeliner, but I don't think we're there yet. You got to be really careful um, about anything you do with eyelash tinting. Yes. If you have blue eyes, as you yes. know, have you, cause you, I confession during COVID, I ran out of ways to entertain myself. So I was yeah. getting my brows like, you know, what do they call it? They call it tinted. And I was getting yeah. my lashes tinted, but I, and permed, <laughs> but I was not doing any, I wasn't getting extensions cause I, whatever. And I didn't also want to put the serum on because the woman told me it will turn your, your, your blue eyes brown or something. And she's like, but there's this yeah. new kind that doesn't do that. I'm like, you know what? And then I just kind of got bored and it was right. expensive and I stopped well, I didn't doing know it. The extensions are something you have to like touch up every few weeks or two weeks or something. I actually thought, cause I got my eye, the opposite of the perm, but I got them straightened because mine are so curly, they just crisscross. Oh. But I gotta tell you, I thought I found that solution, and I'm sure it's because I'm fair and blue eyed, to be like almost painful when she was doing it. So I opted not to get the lash extensions because I'm too much of a pussy. You know, I think it's what's really nice about this conversation, Kathy, is that this is all really about looking natural. Yes. I With mean, we just want to look natural. Beautiful. Yeah. Right? I just want to I mean, look like I sort of have a face and I'm not just a blank slate <laughs> ready to be painted. So, oh, it's so funny though, because w what do you think um, this goes back to? Like where in both of our or yours, maybe because this is about you, not me, your childhood, does this go back to, do you think? And by the way, you oh, look fabulous mother, and gorgeous. Oh, yeah. stop. My mother, who of course I made a star on Kathy Griffin, my life on the D-list and was a natural. But my mother also told me when I was like a little girl, you might be cute, but you'll never be pretty. And you know, <gasps> our mothers say things. And I said later in life, I go, mom, why did you say that? And she goes, I wanted to prepare you. I'm like, mom, you know what they prepared me for? Face tattoos. So now I'm like Mike Tyson. I basically have a giant tattoo on my lips. Well, I mean, you can blame your mom for that and Kathy for taking speed when she was pregnant. Yeah, I have lip tattoos, people. Get used to it. Yeah, and so, but your mom also, when she was pregnant with you, took speed. My mom smoked. When she was yeah. pregnant with me, you know, my that's mom, what they did. She did. My mom actually, um, in a moment when she was had a little too much box wine, she would say something that was like my favorite thing she ever said to me. She goes, um, when I was pregnant with you, Kathleen, those damn doctors in those days, they wanted us to stay thin. So I took speed when I was pregnant with you. And it's the only thing I ever did wrong. <laughs> Uh, my mom, who is still with us, is really wonderful and has done nothing, nothing right. wrong. And, you know, it's really actually helpful to me every time I do a TV hit that I get yeah. off the show and she she notices for future reference yeah. that I need more blush and such. Right. Right. I and mean, it's important. Yes. And it's that I nod too much. See if she ever does anything wrong, which I'm sure she won't. No, she won't. It's good. Um, so where are the dogs? Are you upstairs on that like second? Are you like, if I walk through the door, are you up the stairs to the right? No, no, I'm downstairs in the oh. office. It's my office slash screening room. And um, not slash, but there's a screening room down the hall and there's a gym down the hall. I don't know if you saw the downstairs. Well, okay. If I'm staring at Eric Menendez's portrait yeah. of you and I'm I make a right. Her. No, I make a right. you have to go downstairs. But he's. Yes. You would make a right. Yes. Okay. Past your dressing room. Or is it, am I confused? No, that's still upstairs. But if you go to the Eric Menendez painting, and I should let your listeners know that Eric Menendez did a very beautiful painting of me from prison, although I like to call it his rehab facility. And um, he is also innocent. And by the way, there's a new documentary from one of the guys in Menudo who said that Eric and Lyle's father, Jose, violently raped him oh. so there's now talk that the menendez brothers might actually get a new trial and let me just say this is a controversial take not that they should have killed kitty and jose but the reason he did the painting of me is they like me because even at the time i just kept saying you know kids don't just slaughter their parents they just don't for no reason and also they were already rich so the people that were like, well, they bought Rolexes, they already had access to all that stuff. So I actually have to say, I've always believed that the dad did molest them. And now, all these years later, the guy from Menudo is like, oh, yeah, 
That was Jose Menendez, who worked in tandem with the guy who created Menudo, which mm. kind of makes sense. So anyway, right. it's a fa- fascinating documentary. I think it's on Peacock. I will have to watch it. And yes. there were lots of little things in their threads. And I want to mention, you said it was his rehab, but a little bit before that, you mentioned Zooming on AA. Yes. So congratulations, right? You yes, have- I have three years sober on June 25th. It's amazing. And how do you, why did you choose to do Zoom AA as opposed to in person? Because it was during COVID. So I had my pot uh, during COVID. So what happened was during my infamous Trump scandal, which was now six years ago, I just kind of, you know, at that time, I honestly became like a prescription pill addict. And I'm not saying I don't have addiction issues, but I honestly just wasn't. I didn't have that particular uh, kind of addiction. And I just had a bunch of prescription pills that I had laying around the house. And I had been given them over the years. Like one thing is like, if you're an actress and you have a TV series, they, or even if you're on a TV series, they have like this kind of fakey exam that they do once a year. And I remember doctors sort of just giving me pills. Cause in those days, they were very loosey goosey with pills. Like you'd have a doctor just give you 90 Vicodin if you said you like broke a fingernail. And for some reason, all those years, I kept those pills in my safe. And I kept thinking like, <laughs> kept them for a rainy day. And between the Trump scandal and COVID, I just was like in my house doing pills all day. And then that made me suicidal. So I started with suicidal ideation. And my bottom was when I tried, I took like a hundred benzos, tried to just end it because I was really convinced my husband would be better off. I was never going to get my career back or be happy. I had had a good run. Like in my head, I thought, you know what? You've had a really good life. It's time to go. And I was in like that state and I then fell down the stairs violently, so I injured myself pretty significantly. And then and only then did I call two doctors, and thank God they were dumb enough to give me their cell phone numbers. And I said, look, I took all these pills. I tried to take my life. I didn't die. I I probably need, like, x-rays and stuff. And so I went to the hospital, and when you admit that, which I did, they then put you on the 5150 cycle. So what I is that? Like, what do those numbers mean? Okay, is that a lot. So that's, what, so that's what Britney Spears and Kanye West and folks. And so, because I didn't go and say like, "Oh, I accidentally fell," I was dumb enough to be honest. And they ask you these questions, and they say, "How did you get here?" And I said, "Well, I took like about a hundred Valium, um, Clonopin, uh, Ativan." And I said, I tried to take my life. So they go, they have boxes. They go, okay, she took this many drugs, check. She's admitting she wanted to take her life, check. Um, I wrote a note to my husband, check. And so I pat like, I kind of didn't know because I wasn't in my right state of mind that they were basically going, do we let this girl go home or do we keep her? And they said, okay, we're going to keep you here for observation And then I tried to get out of it because I was like, wait, I don't want to stay in the hospital. I'm fine. And then they had called the cops. So there were two police officers outside the little tent, like, you know, the little ER. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. And they said, if you try to leave, and I never forgot this, they're going to put on the bracelets. And that's like cuffs. Because I kept saying, no, 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 darling. I'm Kathy Griffin. I'm a celebrity. I'll be fine. It's time for me to go home. I'll just drink a lot of water. Like, I didn't know what was happening. So Mm -hmm. they put me in the psych ward. And they were nice enough to give me a room alone. And they had some poor woman posted up at the foot of my bed. And I kept trying to get her to go home because I honestly wasn't taking Wait, wait, wait. Did they pump your stomach or anything? Did they give you charcoal? No, they my stomach. And they, but they gave me like IV fluids and stuff. Okay. And I did say, okay, now that I've tried to do this, I actually have no desire to do it again. And they still, though, their due diligence says we have to keep her. So I was there for 72 hours. Mm-hmm. And then I was texting the doctor saying, how do I get out of here? And they said, do whatever they say. 
So I got a really wonderful female doctor who came in and saw me day two. And she said, I know a married couple and they're in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they literally came to the hospital right then and there. And when I got released after the three days, um, I had, because of COVID, I had like in-house rehab. Oh, and so right. the wife more than the husband came to my house every single day for four months, piss tested me every single day. I was doing three AA Zoom meetings per day. And even though I've still to this day never had a drink of alcohol, AA just was better for me than NA, which is Narcotics Anonymous, because they have way more meetings. It's the same addiction anyway. And so I've been a proud member of AA ever since. And I got, you know, a sponsor and I got sober during COVID. And so I love Zoom meetings because they're so convenient and you can go to them anywhere. And my home meeting is actually in New York and it doesn't matter because of Zoom. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's how I got here. Well, I I think it's incredible. To, and, and thank you for talking to me about all of that, because in a way, I, I'm glad that, as you put it, you were too stupid not to lie. Like yeah. you weren't stupid. You were just an honest person. And, you know, they that helped break the cycle. And did that person who came to your house, like get rid of the pills so that they weren't around oh, anymore? We did what was called a pill dump. Yeah. And I had hidden them all over the house. And even I forgot where I put a ton of them. But I'm telling you, there were like three buckets of pills that we flushed down the toilet. They were, if they were like in clutches. Yeah. They were in pockets. They were in every, you know, every kind of person pocket that I had. They were in obviously the bathroom medicine because I hid it for my husband. And I was yeah. able to convince him that I would take like an occasional pill. And by the way, they were all doctor prescribed. I never like got street drugs. I never did like Coke or anything. But if were you like nodding off or sleeping all the time or something? Or Yes, but honestly, during the whole madness of the Trump scandal, that was such a crazy time. Like, Jen, people forget that that was a seismic yeah. event. And it was the work of a campaign of everybody from the Oval Office to the Department of Justice. I was investigated by two agencies within the DOJ, the mm. U.S. Attorney's Office and the Secret Service. And they were very seriously considering charging me with conspiracy to assassinate the president of the United States. Oh, that's so ridiculous. Yeah. So I was interrogated under oath. Like this was yeah. not a joke. This wasn't like, you know, these celebrities that maybe get one call and then it goes bye bye. Like they took me to the mat and they kept trying to get me to do a perp walk and go to the downtown LA precinct. So they'd have video of me yeah. bracelets and all of that made me kind of go into hiding in my house. Yeah. And that's really when, for me, the pill the pill stuff just went crazy because I was just, you know, I went from being a workaholic and happily touring and doing TV shows and specials to the phone not ringing for six years. Six I can't, years. that's not how you're made up. And I think, yeah. you know, and I think about when you mentioned, you know, you never drank alcohol, you talk about um, in your, in your first book, which I absolutely love, you talk about, it's called oh, wait, the, tell them the title. Cause I'm, I'm going to, it's called the official book club selection. A and memoir. why did I call it that? You called it that because you wanted to be in the Oprah book club. <laughs> Right? Yes. And maybe, maybe for once I should have been smart and shouldn't have done bits about Oprah in my act for like 10 years, because of course she was never going to put me in the book club. But in those days, any book she even uttered would skyrocket to number one. Although that book did end up going to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. That's well, then fuck Oprah. You didn't need her. <laughs> Oh, did I say that? Oh, shit. I'm never going to be in her book club. In the I've spent too many years saying, fuck this person, fuck this executive, <laughs> thinking they would have a sense of humor, and turns out they don't. Let me just go back to the part I was going to say in your fabulous memoir called The Official Book Club Selection, a memoir, according to Kathy Griffin, not Griffith, of course, because that's yeah. a different person. I was thinking of saying, calling you that a few times to see what you'd say. But um, no, but the thing about the pill addiction is when you were a teen, 
you would do this kind of self-comforting ritual of literally making a sheet ice sheet cake every day after school. Jiffy cakes. Remember Jiffy, Jiffy cakes? cakes? Yeah. Yes. So I would, yes, my eating disorder started at like 10 and I was a latchkey kid. Sorry, mom and dad, may you rest in peace. But my mom worked full time and so did my dad. So, and I was the youngest. I was what they called an accident baby, which they proudly called me because my mom would go, well, your father and I are Catholics, not like you, Kathleen, with your blasphemy all the time and calling priests kids fuckers, which I wish you would stop saying in your comedy routine. Anyway, we did something called the rhythm <laughs> method. And then next thing you know, I'm pregnant. So Kathleen, you were an accident. I didn't mean to have a goddamn kid at 40. I already had four. So being a proud accident baby, part of that, you know, means mom and dad had to make extra money. And my mom worked in the admin office of a hospital. And my dad worked in retail. He was a manager of a hi-fi store. Now there's a throwback. Hi-fi. Hi-fi. I mean, that was a big deal getting a hi-fi for your living room. Are you kidding? First of all, the one thing we had the other kids in school didn't have, we all had our own stereo. Like oh, each kid had a in st- your bedroom, you each had I a thought. stereo? I was I part of, you know, my dad worked in hi-fi and I felt very special. But yeah, so I was a rhythm method baby, which means that's a Catholic thing where it's basically pulling out and you're supposed to only have sex when you think you're not ovulating. But my parents enjoyed the drink. I don't think anybody would argue. So I don't know if they could <laughs> keep track of things like calendars. But yes, I would make a Jiffy cake and Jiffy cakes were like, I would call them serving for one, but they weren't a two layer cake. It was like a smallish one layer. And then they made a box of icing. Wait, wait, wait. Is it like the size of like, if you could make brownies, like about that? Yes. Like brownies. So I would make like a Jiffy yellow cake and Jiffy chocolate frosting. And then I would be able to make it before my mom and dad got home from work. And I would eat as much of it as I could then because I had to unbalance my sweet with salty, there was a, a new product on the market you may have heard called Pringles. Oh, God. And, right? And I would go through as much as I could of the Jiffy Cake and the Pringles, but I was so guilty that I would take the, like, wrappers and go to a neighbor's garbage can down the street and put oh, my, my God. Tra- it was so It was so twisted. So I can't twisted. believe you never became a smoker. It's so weird. It's something in me said, whatever you do, don't take a drink. I think I knew as a kid, because my whole family has addiction issues. Well, first of all, we're 100% Irish Catholic. So we were like born to, to drink. And so I never drank. I never smoked, thank God. And that's yes. what's crazy is I'm 62 now. So to get a pill addiction at like 57 years of age was nuts. And I think I kept taking these pills thinking, I can't be an addict. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm too old to be an addict. Everybody starts being an addict when they're like a teenager. And I honestly, for a few years, I like wasn't getting that I had a problem. And then you did. I mean, that's a good side of the story. And let's talk about, you said the phone didn't ring for six years, but you just did a sold out show in Las Vegas. Yes, finally. And by the way, I'm so grateful that the Mirage has been the first, and by the way, so far the last, but fingers crossed, the first place to call me after the Trump photo scandal and say, we want you back. And it's so interesting because when the photo came out, I'm whispering as if this is a secret, the Mirage made a I'll tell anyone, the okay. Mirage made a statement like, we don't condone this. She's not welcome here. But the guy who made that statement, once again, older white guy, my my enemies in life, he finally freaking retired. So then they have a woman who's the booker now. She called my husband, who's my tour manager, and she's like, she sells tickets. We want her back. So I did my first show on June 17th at the Mirage. It was sold out. I was so thrilled to be back on stage. I got a standing ovation. I'm bragging because it's so special to me. And I feel like I'm back. So I don't have an agent. I don't have a manager. I don't have a publicist. It's literally just me. And I'm going to start cold cold calling them and say, I'm Kathy Griffin. You know who I am. Let's not play games. I'm back. Do you want to represent me? Let's route a tour. 
I love it. I mean, you also, I'm screaming into my mic, but you have another show October 6th. Yes. And, and are there even any tickets? Sale. Are there any tickets left for me? There are tickets for you. I would love it if you would come. I'm, I was so flattered. I couldn't believe it. And this, the show I did in June, people flew from Ireland, from France, mm. from all over the United States. I couldn't believe it. So what that tells me is I'm ready. I'm ready to go back. Um, my voice is pretty good. You sound good. Last time we spoke, it's such an improvement, Kathy. Yeah. So what happened was I also, during, um, you know, the, my cancellation, I also got freaking lung cancer, even though I never smoked. And by the way, if one more person is like, well, that's what you get for smoking. Um, screw you. I got freaking cancer. A, B, you know, I never smoked, but I had um, to have half my left lung removed and I got so injured during the surgery that my left vocal cord is permanently paralyzed and I have an aperture above my cords. So my voice is a little limited, like it's about here and it won't get better. But with I use the like Madonna microphone, the headset microphone, and it amplifies way better than a handheld. So now okay. I know I'm going to buy one. I'm going to make sure that... When I go back on tour, not if, but when, I'll be able to be heard. And the audience was very patient because most everybody in the audience there kind of knew my story. But it was like, okay, it worked. So I'm like, I'm ready. I got a call from Carnegie Hall. They said, you're welcome Ooh. back here from the Kennedy Center, which I was banned from the Kennedy Center. Ooh, wow. I was just in enough. Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I've sold it out five times in the past, because did you know that the first lady of the current president automatically has a seat on the board of the Kennedy Center during the president's entire, you know, tenure or the, the, the presidency? So Melania had me banned for four years from the Kennedy Center. Oh How my crazy gosh. is that? I, oof. Well, I have a question about microphones, though. So I'm wondering, yeah. are you going to paint it white or no? Well, that's like Bar you know, Barbara. You know, she has a book time, coming out this fall. The one time I was on Oprah, because, you know, many talk shows I'm on once, because I told the backstory in my special and she got mad at me. But I was on Oprah and she had just done this really iconic interview with Streisand, who, of course, being a gay man, I worship her. <laughs> and she's not nice. Not because Barbara Streisand is warm. She's freaking rough trade. But I love her anyway. And um, when she was on the Oprah show, she made sure that her microphone matched her cream-colored Donna Karen outfit. She made Oprah change the entire set. So Oprah was sitting on a different side, which I'm sure Oprah didn't love. And then when I was on the commercial break of Oprah, I baited her and I go, Oprah, that interview with Streisand was off the chain. It, without missing a beat, Oprah goes, you know, she painted my mic white. And then <laughs> like, we were back from commercial and I was just like beaming because I, I wanted to get an Oprah moment. I did, I admit it. I didn't want to just be there. I wanted to see like, and there's where I got a little window into my beloved Oprah. And I can only imagine the Oprah and Streisand cockfight that happened in the commercial breaks of that show. And I really, really missed the Oprah show. That's like Uber divas together. I can't imagine. Oh but I, I have a second um, microphone question, which is the handheld mic yeah. is so different than having that thing sort of the headset. Yeah. What are you going to do with your hands? I gesticulate a lot. And so this is the first show, the show in Vegas was the first show I had done in my entire career without a handheld and a stand. Like, I just, you know, I think a lot of comedians, we stick with what works. Like, I still use a comedy notebook. I know that's old timey, but I go to like a Rite Aid or a CVS, I get a notebook, uh -huh. I write down my bullet points, and then I just improvise. But I was used to a stand, and sometimes I'd lean on it, but it was really fun to have my hands free and my whole body free, and I was able to, like, get on all fours and make fun of all my PTSD therapy, which oh. one of my therapies is that I do something called cat cow. What? Yeah, you heard me. I will do... My actually, I, I did not so actually... Bad. I didn't hear what? you say that again. Cat cow. Cat cow. Yeah, that's right. I pay someone to come to my home 
and teach me how to go on all fours and, <laughs> clean up and go moo and then go on like I hump my back and you go meow, meow. and <laughs> let me tell you I do cat cow and I will do anything because my PTSD got so bad I couldn't even like leave the house I was just vomiting all the time uh... speaking. it was just it ruined my life so yep. I, got, I have a whole team together and it's really corny. I have kundalini yoga. I don't even know what that is, but I do that once a week. I have a breathing coach. I forgot how to breathe, apparently. So yeah. I have to pay someone to teach me how to inhale and exhale. And then I make animal sounds during it. So can you like, show me? I want to hear all yes, the animals yes. you can do. Okay, so I breathe and then I go rawr, rawr, like I'm a bear. Rawr. Now, so I do a lot of farm animals. So I do cats, cows, bears, and sometimes I'm an angry bear, and sometimes I'm a playful panda. Rawr, rawr. Yeah, I will do anything. I have EMDR therapy. Oh, I've heard about that. What is that? Fantastic. Now, remember, I'm drug-free, so I can't just take like a Valium like a normal person. So uh -huh. I have these buzzers, and the therapy walks you through something traumatic, and then you have these like buzzers that give you a physical sensation in each hand. And somehow it like rejiggers your brain to not stay with like a toxic thought. Like he'll go, okay, picture something. And I go, all right, let's do a picture of Donald Trump, my enemy. Oh. Picture. So naturally I see a picture of Trump and I feel sick. I feel angry. But I don't want to feel those things anymore, right? He's not losing any sleep over me. Although, by the way, he did spend a lot of time trying to ruin me. Like, I still can't get over that there was a president who made Kathy Griffin's career a priority, called the attorney general, and then they carried out the... Okay, anyway. So <laughs> back, and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then I sort of talk it through, like... How do I get out of this sort of thought and move on? And there's something about the physical sensation and talking through with the shrink that now the Trump stuff like doesn't bother me. And in my new stand-up show, I don't even mention him. Like he just doesn't come up. So when a trigger, if, if, if something that would previously trigger, it's sort of, sort of boring to you, you just shrug it off now? Yeah, especially Trump, because I did a whole tour about the incident called right. the Laugh Your Head Off Tour, which, by the way, was the most successful tour I've ever done. And I got to play the Sydney Opera House and I got to play Singapore. And it was a dream come true. But now I'm done with that story. I told it. I told the gory details. Hopefully I made it funny and entertaining. I even made a movie about it called Kathy Griffin, A Hell of a Story. And now I'm ready to like move on to all the other stuff that I find funny and hopefully the audience finds funny. So uh, before I pivot back to the book, um, I'm getting like these notes from my production team saying, you know, that, you know, Politicon never dropped you or canceled you. True. I did Politicon, but Jen, this is called the luck of the Irish. The one time I did Politicon, first of all, I was after that guy, Charlie Kirk, Ah, oh, right. Scary. His fans yep. are an angry mom. Turning Point USA, right? Yes, Turning Point USA. And his fans are like angry guys from like 18. Well, young, a lot of them are youngish guys. And they were chanting, Charlie, Charlie. And like, ladies and gentlemen, Kathy Griffin, like, it's my nightmare. And the, the, the here's the panel. The panel was hosted by Jonathan Capehart. Fine. Yep. The, the only other panelist was Michael Avenatti. Oh, <gasps> oh my God. I was fooled by him, Kathy. For me. Oh, I was totally fooled. I thought he was like Stormy's hero. I've become good friends with Stormy Daniels now. In fact, she came to my Vegas show, which was really great. Oh, can I tell you something, sidebar? When yeah. Stormy walked into the theater, she got a standing ovation. <gasps> Oh, my God. I Isn't love that, awesome? that. Like, my fans know she is a freaking true patriot and a shero. So I was, like, welling up that, Stan, that Stormy got a standing ovation, as she should. But, yeah, Avenatti was next to me. He ate up all the oxygen on the panel. And, naturally, he was teasing his presidential run. Oh, for God's sake. Yeah, he's insufferable. But he's now insufferable in prison. 
Yeah. Oh, my God. There's so much. I mean, there's so many sidebars about him. Like, I only came to find out that there's this famous case. I used to teach contract law in law school. Now I teach a different I course to first year law students. But there's this famous case uh, where this kid tried to buy a Harrier jet with Pepsi points and they made a documentary. Yes, about I it. saw that. And fucking Avenatti was involved in that. No. In my mind, yes. <gasps> Did he get money out of it? Uh, not really. It's it, it, it. I was surprised, and then when you see, and they actually interviewed him. I think from prison for the documentary. It's, it's it, you have to go back and watch it. It's, oh my god! It's I, insane. That's right. No way. He had the ankle bracelet on. He had the ankle bracelet on. Yeah. So your book. It, I, I I always read um, the acknowledgments and the dedications first. Um, probably dedication. This is the first page. And you have this great thing. You quote your father, who's no longer with us, John Patrick Griffin. And here's what you said. Kathy, don't take any crap from these people. I don't care if you ever work again. Um, <laughs> so that's an interesting thing um, that you said, because it looks like it came over, true. It came true. Uh, well, no, but like that, I want to contrast that to something later in the book. Your mom ran into Stephanie Powers, who was the co-star heart of heart. Heart, heart to Heart, God, oh. in the 80s. Um, and she, your mom, you know, harasses her into, you know, you know, my daughter's an actor and blah, blah, blah. What, what do you have any advice for her? And she said, tell her to take everything, never turn down work. So these, you are obsessed with working. You love yeah. to be busy. You love to work. Love it. I love to make people laugh. I live to make people laugh. I don't care if it's a TV show, a commercial, a voiceover, live show, tape special, whatever I can do to make people laugh. And yet at the same time, your authenticity and to make people laugh does push buttons and sometimes crosses lines. Yeah. And so these things are kind of in tension with each other. You seem to have, it hasn't gotten the best of you. You are now back, I will say touring, even though it's just so far two shows in Vegas, but it's 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 huge. Uh, Kathy is back, bitches. <laughs> but um, how, how have you managed that push and pull between wanting to get work, you know, wanting the job, wanting to land it with also wanting to be yourself and fuck everybody, like your dad said. Well, that's really my brand, which I'm very proud of, which I call the D-list. So, you know, I'm a proud D-lister. I'll never be an A-lister, which is actually all fine with me. And I think the D-list is a great place to live. Like I can go out, I get recognized a little but now like my friends that they can't go anywhere and they can't have a life and they're prisoners of their fame. And also like I'm under the radar enough that like I don't get in the trouble that frankly I should for some of the stuff I say, because when I'm on stage, I know that my fans and I don't have the biggest fan base in the world, but God love them. They're passionate and they know I'm going to say the thing that maybe they're afraid to say or whatever. And they know that I almost 90% of my act is things that have happened to me. So I'm not stealing anybody's jokes. I don't have a writer. I've never had a writer. And I like to tell stories of how I sort of get into these predicaments. My life is a sitcom, whether someone's filming it or not. I mean, look, when you came to my house for one of my dinner salons, because I live to have dinner parties and lunch parties, that are like old fashioned salons and it's phones down, no phones, real life conversation. And I have a guest of honor because for some reason that sort of shifts the way people show up. And the one you came to the guest of honor was the great Martin Sheen. And he was there with Mary Trump because I knew Martin would want to meet Mary and vice versa. And, you know, the whole story of how that came to be is now in my act. I basically stalked. It is? Yes. I basically Fuck. stalked Martin Sheen. Like I just, once I found out he lived in Malibu, which is where I now live with my husband, I was like on a mission to meet him because the day the Trump photo went live and Trump made the statement and CNN fired me and all that, somehow Martin Sheen got my phone number and he called me and he talked me off the ledge. And he said, I think he said, Kathy, one voice with passion is a consensus. I think that's what he said. And I never saw him after that. And then sure enough, my husband was working the polls at the midterms and he walked in 
And my husband said, hey, you know, Mr. Sheen, I don't need to trouble you, but I'm Kathy Griffin's husband. And it meant the world when you called her on that dark Aww. night. Yeah. And that's when I got his number. And then I just started like, come on over for lunch. Me be here. Hey. And, you know, I, I was so thrilled that he came to that salon because like who doesn't want to meet President Bartlett? And also, <laughs> he kind of is President Bartlett from the oh, West. Oh, he Wing. is. I, I love him and his wife Janet. And I have such a authentic, really magical. And I love how he just he had the kind of gravitas where he was not all that talkative at first during lunch, even though you're kind of going around the table and everyone was kind of, you know, pitching in. But there was this one moment when we kind of settled in after lunch, and he just began. You know, yeah. and it was. It was so amazing. Um, he just has all the stories from his political activism to his celebrity life. And he's extremely sweet and humble. And whenever I've seen him, if it's on set, he wants to talk to the, well, what they call below the line folks more than the celebrity. Like, he's just the real deal. So people like that fascinate me. And, you know, he knows he's in the act. He knows it was inevitable. But I make it funny and I adore him. So it's not like I make fun of him. I make fun of myself and how I was on a mission to get him to come over and a mission to introduce him to Mary Trump, who is also quite shy and quite introverted. Yes. My so, favorite part was, was when... When Martin was outside talking with up front, talking to Mary and giving her some rosary yeah. beads, we were inside talking to Janet and trying to convince her and Martin to get on TikTok because Mandy right. Patinkin was on TikTok with who with his wife. Anthony and Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins is big on TikTok, and that's why <laughs> Martin is good friends. So we were trying to explain what TikTok even is. And then when I told him what Anthony was doing, by the way, I don't know Anthony Hopkins. I'm saying that like I do. <laughs> he, he has, it was so funny. I said, well, Anthony Hopkins does these funny videos. And Martin goes, is he drinking again? I said, no, he's just a guy on TikTok. And oh my gosh. Because he's just real. You know, I think about your career and how smart it was that you decided you wanted to be like the funny sidekick. Because, you know, what I always thought, you know, when I would see movies or musicals when I was young, you know, and you look at that long, that young, beautiful ingenue who gets all the like nice clothes and the beautiful like gets solos. The boy, gets the guy. Yeah. And, you know, it's like the ingenue or the leading man, like the ingenue is like someone's first wife, like it just, or the leading guy is like the, you know, football star who like later, you know, drinks beer, you know, and doesn't really make anything of himself. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that if you decide to be, do what you did or do what something like Joan Cusack does or do, you know, that, that the roles or Janine uh, Garofalo, yeah. those are always the actors. You are the people who I like, who are interesting. And yet- to make that choice when you were get you know starting out with the groundlings when you were young was super smart. Um, how how did you do that? And then I want to also marry this a bit to you. You've mentioned a few times your reality TV show, um, The D List, and, I, I, yeah. and how I loved in your book how that came about. Like I didn't oh. even know. And, and so you know where you were think thought you were going to be going in terms of you know, I mean, you did do sitcoms. I mean, you did do Suddenly Susan. You have done the sort of traditional TV sitcom, but you created, you kind of jumped into the reality space and kind of made lemonades out of lemons that time and many times. Can you talk about how that came to be? Yeah, look, the, the is, wanting to be the sidekick, I can't help because I grew up loving Phyllis on the Mary Tyler Moore show and Rhoda and uh -huh. Ethel on the Lucy show. And I just remember thinking, you know, the sidekick, they get the jokes. Like the pretty girl is the star, but I thought I want to be the sidekick. And so the other, the way I learned that that would probably be smart to pursue was when I was in the groundlings, I remember there was a girl who was very, very talented, very funny, but she was very upset that she wasn't going up for the pretty girl parts and getting the guy. And I think she kind of screwed herself because she spent her whole career like trying to get those auditions when I learned, like I was the sidekick to Brooke Shields, you have to be Brooke Shields beautiful to get those roles. Right. And so this girl was a very attractive girl and she got guys in real life. 
but that wasn't enough for her. And I mm. thought, you know, I can do this stuff in my real life. I don't need to do it on screen. And so I got to play the sidekick on a bunch of guest star parts. And then when that Sally Susan gig came up, I was thrilled to play second fiddle to Brooke Shields because right. she had an order for 23 episodes. I right. didn't, you know, and I'm not going to, I love how you put it that way. Know? You're so funny. It's like, it's like, that's work. It's like, she has an oh, order yeah. for 23. So that's a job, a working actor, as opposed to like what people I mean, kind of, are right. you kidding? Overnight, I went from being broke, I mean broke, and being a Kelly girl temp, there I'm dating myself, to making <laughs> 15,000 bucks a week. Like it was madness. And I was so thrilled. And luckily my mom, the one thing she was amazing about is she was great about telling me to save my money. So I socked it away at the same time. I bought a house my first year of that show because I thought- So smart. Buy oh a gosh. house, pay it off. I didn't pay it off at first, but Susie Orman tell, uh, talked me into paying it off and she was right. But anyway, so that's how I wanted to be the sidekick. I love kid. that little name drop there. Okay, go ahead. Susie Orman is, is fucking she's, awesome. Yeah, she's, she's, awesome. she's good a good advice. pal. Yep. She's never steered me wrong. She's the real deal. And then as far as the D-list- there's this whole thing in Hollywood that people don't talk about. And I got it from the idea of where people are seated for the Golden Globe Awards. And I noticed that the very front, closest to the stage, are movie stars only. Jack Nicholson, Tom Hanks, people that don't even do television. But television stars are really big, like you've got the cast of Friends. Well, they're not in that front section. So according to that world, they're almost considered B-list. And I thought, okay, <laughs> if this, if I was going to go be in the Golden Globe, go to the Golden Globes, I would have to be in the parking lot. Like I'd be so far from the stage. And that's how I came up with the name, the D-list. <laughs> and I thought, that's where I live. I live proudly on the D-list. And then when I met with NBC, I wanted a four camera sitcom like Suddenly Susan, with a budget, big budget, all the stuff. And of course, at the time, Jeff Zucker, who then became, of course, another one of my enemies, um, <laughs> he was like, well, we'd rather do a show for you on Bravo, not NBC, pay you almost nothing, have you do all the writing yourself, because we can just follow you around with the camera crew. And my goal was to try to turn a reality show as close into a sitcom as possible. And so all the premises that were on Kathy Griffin, my life on the deal is were real. And I think, I think that I couldn't do that show now because I don't think reality shows are nearly that real. And right. even in season six of Kathy Griffin, my life on the deal list, Bravo started sending me written liners to do during my interviews. And I was like very insulted by that. And I said, no, no, I, this is what I do. I can comment on the stuff we've filmed out in the field. And then after six years, you know, they didn't renew it anymore, but I was still doing specials there. And then my tenure there ended and I haven't done a special since 2013. So I'm desperate to do another comedy special at any streamer, any network, whatever, but I'm, I'm ready. And I will never lose my D-list brand, especially after the Trump scandal. Like, I'm back to biting and scratching again. Uh, I have years of experience doing that. Well, now you're saying the front row is the movie stars, but you are also a movie star. You were in Pulp Fiction, right? I carried that film. They would right? not have won the Palme d'Or <laughs> at France if it weren't for my three lines in Pulp Fiction. Well, let me tell you how I got that the old-fashioned way. I was dating Quentin <gasps> Tarantino. Wait, 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 wait. You heard me. Press pause. Yeah. Before Miro Servino was? Oh, Did yeah. She... I trained him. No. Um, I went wait, out wait, wait. You, you dated oh. Quentin Tarantino? Is he utterly nuts or is he a good yes. boyfriend? He's okay. utterly nuts and was my boyfriend. Um, okay. And I, first of all, we went out a few times and I don't, I think I might have been the only one that thought it was my boyfriend, but he, <laughs> he was so nice to me and he gave me that little part in Pulp Fiction and he put me in his episode of ER, which was like a giant show at the time. And you got and to he, meet Clooney, which is, I mean, I can't even fucking believe that. George Clooney is in love with me. I don't know how to tell you, but he gets nervous <laughs> around me and I think he's just... I think a divorce is around the corner and he's going to come back home to mama. But I think he went for, for his, his wife, the, the, you know, the, the, the lawyer, because I wasn't available actually. Yeah. It's to make us jealous. 
I know. It's right. It's fair. Eventually yeah. it will run its course and we can be in a thruple. But I oh my gosh. That would like, be super fun, Kathy. But I, you, I don't have a but I don't have a banging bikini bod like you. I could work. I could work. I on do it. have a banging bikini bod, and let me tell you why. On Kathy Griffin My Life from the D-List, we did a scene with Paris Hilton, who I actually really love. And she, of course, looks amazing in bikini. So I th- I knew it would be funny if I was traipsing around at like whatever I was, like 50 or whatever. And I had not worn a bikini in decades. Like I was that person that would go to the beach like Fonzie, like completely covered. If I could wear a burqa, I would. And I put on that bathing suit. And then someone, you know, they took my picture and put it in a couple of magazines because it was like, oh, wacky comedian in a bikini. And then I got phone calls from like People Magazine going, we want to do a bikini shoot with you. And I was like, what? And so, honey, you know, I worked that angle for a while. Like, I was just calling the Star Magazine going, hey, put a picture of me in a bikini, put it over. And I must have done five <laughs> bikini shoots because I thought anything to stay in the press, anything to promote my show, anything to sell tickets. And I still live by that. I love that. The, the photo is in the book and it, you look fabulous. But what was the thing Paris said to you? Something like, you're going to look huge in this, right? She, yeah, she kept saying... Um, or large yeah. or, or something. Wait, she huge. had some word I forgot. Oh, but let me grab Paris the book. Paris has her own language. Hold on, let me get the book. Okay, good. And Paris has her own language that I had to I had to take classes to learn how she speaks. Like one time I saw her go up to Jenny McCarthy and Paris said, um, to my party? How was <laughs> and I was like, wait, oh wait, that translates into I am having a social event that I would like to att- you to attend. Have your publicist call my publicist for details. So comes to my party. You know, she didn't pay attention at school. I'm not going to lie. But comes to my party was her way of saying, you know, and then publicist. <laughs> and then that just, so that's how Hollywood people find each other. They have their publicist call their publicist. And of course, since I don't have one, I would just call using like a foreign accent and say I was my yeah. <laughs> Okay. So I'm just fact checking the language here. Uh, page 321 um, of the book, uh, official book club selection, a memoir, according to Kathy Griffin. We have the uh, part that you mentioned. So it says um, she picked out a blue and green paisley bikini for me and said, you'd look huge in this. Yeah, which and I said, go fuck yourself. I did because I didn't appreciate her implying that I was morbidly obese because I take people literally. That's another problem I have. Not and that there's so, anything wrong with that if that's what you wanted, but that's not what you wanted. I love Lizzo. Anyway, I I have her records and I still say the word record. But yeah, when Paris was like, you're going to be yeah, I didn't know what that meant initially. So naturally, like I've done to many people in Hollywood, I said, go fuck yourself. And uh-huh. luckily for me, she giggled. <laughs> and that's all I ask. That, by the way, A-listers, just for God's sake, just laugh at my jokes. All right? Just, every, you'll, you're fine. I'm punching up. I don't punch down. I, you know, if I'm going to get in somebody's face and say that, trust me, they probably have millions of dollars like Paris who seemed to survive her day with Kathy Griffin. Yeah, I mean, I think taking, what do they say in England? Something like taking the the piss piss. out of it. It's important to do that. I mean, I think if I were one of those A-list celebrity type people, you know, the way society works is there's going to be some envy. That's the way it all works. And if you let someone just sort of like make a joke and you laugh it off, it shows that you have a sense of humor about the sort of good fortune that you had because you were able to get to where you were. There was hard work, I'm sure. Uh, there was maybe some baby, you know, uh, what is it called? Nepo baby Nepo stuff, maybe. happening. You know, but let people laugh a little, laugh at yourself. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, well, a lot so, of the young starlets are not so good at that. Like, there was a time when Taylor Swift was hanging out with the squad, and I, um, I ooh, was... No, no, wait, 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 not the congressional squad. You mean like Lindsay Lohan squad? Yes, not Lindsay Graham squad. It was like <laughs> Taylor Swift, Lord, um, Selena Gomez, uh... Haim, Haim, how do you say that girl band? And so I was in, I was actually at an award show and I was in the ladies' room and they all, they were all in there like a girl gang, or I should say like the girl gang that they are. And I was nervous. I thought they weren't going to just jump me. I did. (laughs) This is it. I've been making fun of these girls, 
Lana Del Rey doesn't care for my work, but I can't, I have to wait it out because honestly, a lot of the A-listers do finally come around when they get a little older. So now, like, when I run into, like, I ran into Selena Gomez and she was so lovely. And I'm just like, thank you. Thank you for just getting like, oh, you're just a comedian. And Miley Cyrus finally came up to me one time and she goes, oh, so you've just been kidding this whole time? And I said, yes, yes, <laughs> I made fun of you. I am just teasing you because you are a multimillionaire at the time teenager who is wildly talented and of course <laughs> will be fine and is fine and is I love her talent. And so I really get like a thrill when I then run into someone from my act who like is like laughing along. So right. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You know, I want to ask you, I got a couple of things before we we wrap up. Um, one thing I want to ask you is this, you know, the gays have always loved you. And so I wonder whether you know or absolutely also love Jennifer Coolidge in season oh two of White Lotus. Honey, first of all, let me tell you something. She has better gays than I do. No, no. I've talked to my gays. I'm returning a few of them. Sometimes <laughs> you have to throw one out with the bathwater because her gays are like Mike White, who wrote White, White Lotus with her in mind. Michael Patrick King, who put her into Broke Girls. Like My gays are like, do you have any masks? And you know, I don't, I don't, I love them. And my gays are like still turning tricks on corners and they're fun. They're wonderful. We're friends. But yeah, Jennifer Coolidge and I started out together. I love her. And what I love is I love that she's getting her flowers, as they say, because Jen has been this good for 30 years. We started mm-hmm. out the Groundlings improv group in Los Angeles together. She was? I didn't know that. Yes, we were uh... the Groundlings. We actually, in fact, here's a story. We actually got what we thought was going to be our big break. Many years ago, while the Roseanne sitcom was still on, Roseanne got a show to go up against Saturday Night Live called Saturday Night Special. And she cast both Jennifer Coolidge and I in like the little like six person ensemble. So Jen and I got to work together. And because Roseanne was so big at the time, or as Parasol would say, huge, <laughs> she got all these amazing stars to come on and introduce bands and guest stars. And we got to meet so many cool people. And then both of us, the phone didn't ring for years. But Jennifer's, you know, she's had parts here and there, and she's amazing in the Christopher Guest movies. But I love right. her. Best in show. Oh my Best God. in show. And she's just... Jennifer Coolidge is always good and she's yep. signature. Nobody else can do what she does. And that's what I love about her. And I love that she's having all the success because let's not lie to be a mature lady. Even if you're a comedy chick, it's tough, man. It's there's still like five old white guys that sign all the checks in Hollywood and they decide every single thing that you watch on TV or streaming and movies and if they don't like you or if they've aged you out of the system, you're screwed. So I'm thrilled that Jennifer is, everybody's waking up to how amazing she is, but she's always been this good. Yeah, which is, I'm just going to do the too long, didn't listen. Fuck that bitch. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I love her. I love her. I love you. Yeah. Okay. So my last question for you is kind of bringing it back to the, um, the, 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 what are you, the lip tattoos. Yes. Did you check with Stevie Nicks before you went and did this? You mean my guardian angel, Stevie Nicks? Well, she did send you that whole makeup kit, Kathy. Uh, And Stevie Nicks did not turn on me during the Trump scandal. And in fact, has given me shout outs from her shows, not once, not twice, but three times. She has dedicated landslide to me. (gasps) Wait, no, no. The Hollywood Bowl. Yes. What? How come I didn't know this? Dedicated to my friend, Kathy Griffin. Like, such a meaningful stamp of approval from an icon who, by the way, has never pissed off anybody. And yet she's got the bravery of 10 men. And yes, she saw me on the Stephen Colbert show and she didn't like my makeup. So she put together an entire makeup kit for me with a note. And I have never changed, (laughs) nor would I ever argue with her advice. So I just think she is, I just think she is amazing and talented and the real deal and sweet and fearless and has put up with God only knows what from guys over the centuries. I am just, I'm I almost, say centuries because she is, she is a wicked. 
She's a witch. That's true, this centuries. But I'm just, I'm sitting here kind of been, I'm like transported. Like I yeah. cannot believe, first of all, everyone knows that landslide is about them, right? But that she actually sang it to right. you, dedicated it to you. Right. It was magical. She's a magical person. She's one of those truly magical people. And she always works, man. She is always on tour either with the band or herself. And I love that she's always on the road. She takes her dogs with her. She meets people like she is just amazing. And, and she knows how to accessorize with all the scarves. I need some some lessons. It's a lot that. of scarf coordination yeah. and fringe, a lot of fringe. <laughs> so um, what didn't I ask you that you wanted to talk about? Just that I'm glad to be back and just that I hope that the Trump toxic whatever tattoo on me has finally faded and that I want to just go on and make folks laugh and, you know, folks shouldn't be afraid of me. And look, I think a lot of my fans in the South, I've probably lost for good, which makes me really sad. But I think I found a lot of new folks and I'm excited to go out there. I love doing it. I have all new material. I love doing it. And if I do a tour, I'll write a whole new show and I'll do that one. Amazing. Um, anything? Uh, oh, I know. How do people find you? Like, I know there are only a few tickets left uh, for the Vegas show at the Mirage in October, but how do they get them? How do they find you? How do they tell their venues around them to bring you? Like, do I need oh, to like drive that. out to the casino in, in Connecticut and tell them to bring you? Like, what do we need to do? Well, I've played all the casinos in Connecticut. You should know I've been to Uncasville many times. I've played Foxwoods and Mohegan. And um, I I love uh, touring. I'll go anywhere and everywhere. And honestly, right now, social media. So Instagram, I just joined Threads. Like, oh, Wait, wait, you just joined Threads? threads? Yes. This is like a fucking 24-hour phenomenon. We're talking to each other on Thursday. Yeah. What is this, July 6th? It was like less than 24 hours ago, and there's more than 30 million people on Threads. Because think people it's had be? it with Elon. They have had it with Elon, and Twitter is turning into social, uh, truth social. So I'm on Instagram, TikTok, and Threads. Instagram, TikTok, and Threads. Are you the same person each place? Kathy Griffin? Just all Kathy one Griffin. Word? All of them, yeah. Okay. And so you're not Kathy Griffith. Who is that person? Kathy Griffith is someone, well, I was name checked in both impeachment hearings and they called me Kathy Lee Griffin. Because <laughs> people that don't know me think I'm either Kathy Lee Gifford or Reba. Oh, right. Kathy Gifford. That's right, right. I always think that's, they think you're Reba, which is, isn't Reba like um, the, what's his name's wife? Uh, wait. Who? Oh, Reba. Wait, wait. Who's Reba? You mean Reba, Reba McIntyre? McIntyre? The singer. Oh, well, we I thought you meant. resemble each other. And so, and by the way, I feel bad for Reba and Kathy Lee because they probably had to deal with like, who knows what, like harassment because people think they're me. But I am not Kathy Lee Gifford. She is a separate woman who is very Christian and sings to Jesus a lot. I'm not Reba McIntyre, who is a kick-ass country singer who can buy and sell me 10 times over. I'm just Kathy Griffin. Just Kathy Griffin on TikTok, Threads, and Instagram. And that's where I promote my stuff. Come find me, see what I'm up to. And, uh, you know, we'll see if I can get there on the road and do a special, maybe a sitcom. Who knows? I'm so excited. This is great. I am so glad you're back. Um, and fuck Jeff Zucker. Um, you didn't say it. I did. Uh, right. You know. <laughs> and fuck him. Yeah. Fuck, last fuck him. The usual list. I've met him twice. I tried to impress him and I like totally made a fool of myself. And then I realized what difference does it fucking make? Yeah, he's awful. He's awful. Yeah. Okay. Cool, <laughs> Kathy. It's been it's been real. Can't wait to see you in October. I love you. I know I do. I still have the chills. I cannot believe. I mean, it must be true, and I'm going to have to Google it. So I hope it's true. Uh, I can't believe that Stevie Nicks dedicated the song "Landslide" to Kathy when Stevie was performing at the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, it just, it's, it's phenomenal. It just shows you the power of friendship, um, friends who are there for you when you are struggling at one of the darkest points in your life. Um, it's great speaking with Kathy. I know some of what we are talking about was silly or maybe you think it's superficial, um, but all of that stuff about how we 
feel that we appear in the world, all of the kinds of childhood anxieties and ambitions and trying to be a working woman in this world that doesn't necessarily appreciate when women work for themselves as opposed to in service of others, like exclusively in service of their partners or their children or in a supporting role for, let's say, a man. Those kinds of things are already still, still in this century taboo. And on top of that, to have the audacity to be a woman who ages in public as opposed to sort of retreating into a bathrobe and curlers in the house. All of that stuff that we internalize sometimes results in us being obsessed or worried about how we look. Um, And so, you know, this show is all about talking about the real stuff, Um, the real stuff that you, me, and our favorite authors go through in the context of their lives and their creative work. And so I am so glad that you joined us today. um, And we will be back next week with another episode of Booked Up. Let me know what you think of this raw and real approach to interviews. Send us an email at bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write to us at Booked Up at PO Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give us a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast.